Well, happy Sabbath. Uh, let's begin our study with the word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can uh, meet together on the Sabbath and that we can open your word and that your Holy Spirit that is promised will be here uh, to teach us. We ask, Lord, that we can receive uh, the things you have for us, that, um, that we can be broken and that we can um, see clearly a representation of Christ as we study into the symbolic use of numbers of Palmoni. Uh, we pray for each person. We ask that uh, the work that you are doing in us, that you can complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. Happy Sabbath. And um, so what we have here with this study is... Well, this is the beginning of the study of Samuel Snow's letters, but it's it's not going to be uh, something that I just do quickly. So one is uh, this this study I first gave in um, uh, 2017 when I was at. Uh, let me think. I'm trying to think here exactly how that was. Um, so I'm thinking in 2017. When I was at the School of the Prophets, I ended up giving a study on, on the structure of prophetic chronology. And, and, and the main part of the study really had to do with these structural chiasms. And, and so it led into uh, the study of Ezekiel um, or Ezra. But I did a more, more thorough study on Ezra uh, later on. So I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly. I, I think I'm forgetting things. Um, in 2018, I know that I was um, addressing, oh, I'm trying to remember, I was dealing with the week of Christ. So it must have been 2017 that I had notes on Ezra chapter 7. And I went through how the biblical calendar worked and all kinds of different things at the School of the Prophets that, that fall, 2017. Um, now, one of the things, one of the truths that we came to understand in 2013, on August 31st, 2013, at uh, the camp meeting in Sylvan Lake, um, Jeff was there and he asked a question regarding Ezra 7-9. And so uh, earlier that, that year, uh, Emiliano had uh, come to understand something about the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. And, and it took us a long time um, to understand this, that it, it's not going to be until the camp meeting uh, in 2014 that uh, Noel is going to present uh, the chronology of the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month and its relationship to Millerite history. Now, um, we're first going to look at it, of course, in 457 B.C., so we're going to look at, at this chronology. Now, we think about it. So we think back 2013. So I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out on, on that day. I write a little short paper on it, um, showing that the first day of the first month is August 15th, 18, or first day of the fifth month is August 15th, 1844. Because um, I understand how the biblical calendar works. Now, I know when Jeff presented it, um, he didn't understand that. He thought there were 30 days in each month on the biblical calendar. And it was a common misconception that people have um, because the cal biblical calendar is based upon the moon and the, the month is, um, you know, is slightly longer than a 29 and a half days, right? So, so that, that problem just most people aren't aware of. And so it's a, it's a fairly technical thing. You know, lots of times people just say, you know, the average month is 29 and a half days, which isn't exactly correct either, right? Because it's a bit more. But anyway, um, this understanding of Ezra 7-9 is extremely important because we have the symbols of the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month. And as Seventh-day Adventists, if we don't understand Ezra 7 to 10, we actually cannot understand 
of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. That is, if you ask the average, average Seventh-day Adventist who knows about the, the, the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, like let's say they know that the 70 weeks start in 457 BC. If you were to ask them when in 457 BC does the 70 weeks and the 2300 days begin, what would they say? They'd say, I don't know. Oh, no, the ones who know about it, right? So the, I'm talking about people who, who know about the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, people who might even present it. You know, they in might 457. do 457. Okay, they'll say, it for, but if you ask them when in 457, they when will like always say. Or something? Is it like in the fall or something? Yeah, they'll say in the fall. So in the fall of 457, okay? Can't pinpoint it though. Yes, but, but they'll say in the fall. Now, if you say in what year of Artaxerxes' reign did um, the, the, the 2300 days and the 70 weeks begin, well, they would, they would go here. There went up some singers, or some of the children of Israel, and the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanim, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. So they will say it's in the fall of 457 B.C., and they will say, in what year of Artaxerxes, if you ask what year of Artaxerxes, in the fall, does the 2300 days in the 70 weeks begin? And what, what would they say? Would they say in the seventh year of Artaxerxes in the fall? They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't know. No, no, they would know. They would know that it's in the fall that's of how, Artaxerxes. That's how I read. But they it doesn't fall, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't have a pinpoint. They wouldn't they have would a say, pinpoint. They would think, but they would say it's the seventh year, right? It, it reads that way, yeah. Well, it doesn't read that way, but they they oh, read okay. it because it's actually in the eighth How year. How does of it read? It's in the eighth okay, year. Of well, our what, when you say it doesn't actually read that way, I'm reading it and it says which was in the seventh year. So how That's is it not reading that way? That's when they leave Babylon. Sir? You so in verse one of chapter seven, Theodore. What's that? You oh, in verse came one to of Jerusalem. chapter seven. Okay, you guys just listen. Mm -hmm. I'll explain it all. You don't need to keep asking. Okay. No. No, I yeah. want to listen. <laughs> I was just asking, are you in the seventh okay. in the seventh chapter of Ezra in the first verse? Well, no. Well, we're reading that Ezra 7, 9 and Ezra 7, 7 says it's the seventh year of Artaxerxes that they leave Babylon, right? So I'm going to read it. This Ezra went up from Babylon and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests according to the hand of the Lord God, Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the porters, the Nethanim, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. So they leave Babylon in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, right? That's what it says. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. So we know that the fifth month is also in the seventh year of, of Artaxerxes. And upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Right? So we know that, that this these occur in the seventh year. But are these in the fall? Is the first day of the first month in the fall of 457? No, it's not. Okay. And is the first day of the fifth month in the fall? It's about the middle of the year, right? Right. Well, yeah, it's it's in August. Okay. Yeah. But we know that that the commandment goes into effect in the fall. And and how are we counting Artaxerxes' reign? Are we counting it spring to spring or fall to fall? I'm thinking spring to spring. Fall to fall for political. Yeah, it, well, and, and we can tell this because if we go to the book of uh, Nehemiah, which is, you know, also put together. Of fall, to fall for political, spring to spring for the religious? Is no, that... 
No. Well, yeah, the, but we have a civil calendar and a religious calendar. But sometimes rains are counted spring to spring, uh, and and yeah. actually, and actually, um, um, Artaxerxes would have counted his own rain spring to spring. But the Jews counted his rain fall to fall, and we can tell this by uh, Nehemiah. So in Nehemiah one one, it says, "Why do the they count them differently? What reason? Some of them. How would you know? Like I know you know, but how, how do you yeah. how do you tell?" Well, that that's a huge question. You have to read each account. Okay, you, you have, have to read, to read each read account. account. So here we're going to have the reign of Artaxerxes uh, going to be described in the book of Nehemiah, right? So Nehemiah, which actually used to be part of the book of Ezra, right? It says, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Halakiah, and it came to pass in the month Kislev in the 20th year. Now, that's the 20th year of Artaxerxes as I was in Shushan in the palace. Now the, the month Kislev is the ninth month. And, and you always count the months from the spring, right? So, but it's the, it's, it's the ninth, what we would call the ninth month on the biblical calendar in the 20th year. And then there's gonna be Nehemiah's prayer. And then chapter two is gonna follow chapter one. And it says it came to pass in the month Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. Now, the month Nisan, uh, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, following the ninth month in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, shows that we're counting this rain fall to fall. Does that make sense to people? Yes. Okay. Because because the, the ninth month is counted spring to spring, and when we get to Nisan, that's the first month. But it's still in the 20th year. So that means we must be counting this reign of Artaxerxes fall to fall. So that's one thing we know. Okay, so when we go back to Ezra uh, chapter 7, and, and we look at um, this, you know, verse 9 upon the first day of the first month, we know that, that that's still going to be in uh, the seventh year because both of them are said to be in the seventh year. But the eighth year is going to begin in the fall, and the eighth year is going to begin on the first day of the seventh month. Right? And, and we actually can pinpoint it, which is what we're going to show here, that the 2300 days in the 70 weeks begin on the 10th day of the seventh month. So that means they begin 10 days into Artaxerxes' eighth year. And you need to know this. Like if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you start to believe that it's in the seventh year or, or the, the seventh year of Artaxerxes and that it's um, that it's in the fall, well, then you would actually have to go to the fall of 458 for it to be in the seventh year. Right. So you couldn't start in 457. And, and this confuses people all the time. Because you can't start the seventh year of Artaxerxes in the spring of 457. And some people try to do that. Right. And so you can easily show that it's not possible that the seventh year of Artaxerxes, when it begins in the spring, is in the spring of 458. It's just, it's like undeniable proof that you can show from the documents. So, so we have this problem that most Seventh-day Adventists who believe in the 70 weeks and the 2300 days have no idea how to count the beginning. They just know Ellen White says that the decree goes into effect in the fall. Right. And so, so they know that statement and they know it's in 457. But she never says it's in, in the seventh year of Artaxerxes that the decree goes into effect. Ellen White understands this chronology. Okay. Now, we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail. So we're going to look at the verses, and then we're going to look at the chart. Now, um, when you look at Ezra chapter 8, it's going to give you a bit more information about this trip from Babylon uh, to uh, Jerusalem. And it's going to start in 8.15. It's kind of interesting, eh? This story. 
is going to start on Ezra eight fifteen. Yeah, right. Yeah, it 15. is actually. Uh, I'm, I'm actually grasping a little bit of it. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I gather them together to the river that runneth to Ahava, and there we abode in tents three days. So, so they're going to leave on the first day of the first month, and it's going to give this list of all these people, um, these priests, and so forth. Um, that are going to go with Ezra. Oh, but they have this meeting place. So uh, they don't all just leave at the, at the same, from the same place. They leave from different places. So they've organized this. They have the decree of Artaxerxes has, has been issued earlier, right? Because he already has the decree. They have to make some plans and they decide to leave. Um, Ezra does on the first day of the first month. And then they're going to get to Ahava, and they're going to stay there for three days. Uh, and then I sent for Eliezer, uh, and he says, I, I found there none of the sons of Levi. So there's no Levites. He just has priests. So then I sent for, then sent I for Eliezer, for Ariel, for Shemamiah, for Elnathan, and for Jerob, and Elnathan, and for uh, Nathan, and for Zechariah, for Meshulam, chief men also, for Joiarib, and for Elnathan, men of understanding. And I sent them with commandment unto Ido the chief at the place Casaphia. And I told them that they should say unto Ido and to his brethren, the Nethanim, at the pl place Casaphia, that they should bring us unto us ministers for the house of God. And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding, the son of Mahal, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, right? Goes through all this. Um, so he's going to send for some Levites, right? So then it says, also of the Nethanim, whom David, the princes, had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanim, all of them were expressed by name. So they're going to have... Uh, some Levites that are going to come, and then some Nethanim, right? 220, which is a symbol of restoration. And then he says, I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones. And I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, the hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him but his power and his wrath is against all that forsake him. So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. So he's saying, we didn't look for protection from um, Artaxerxes, from his, his soldiers, right? We, we actually sought protection from God. And, and the reason they did that is, you know, he made a claim that God can protect us. It would have been uh, a misrepresentation it would have it would have showed that he didn't trust God if he had actually asked for, um, you know, uh, protection while they traveled to Jerusalem from Babylon. So it's a, an interesting detail here. So and then so he's going to have this fast. They're going to be there three days. So there's going to be a three day fast. And then he says, I separated 12 of the chief of the priests. And, and, and he's going to weigh unto them the silver and the gold and the vessels, even the offering of the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his Lord, lords and all Israel there present had offered. Now, we have to remember that the temple has already been built. So most Seventh-day Adventists uh, have this idea that the temple is built under the decree of Artaxerxes, but it was actually built under the decree, decree of Darius. And so that's some, you know, 59 years earlier. So the temple's been around for a while. So these this gold and this silver uh, that's being given, some from Artaxerxes, some from the offering of the counselors and lords and, and all Israel there present, this gold and silver is going to be divided to these uh, 12 chief of the priests, right? So 12 priests are going to be uh, carrying this in their, in their luggage. Right. So they're going to be responsible for this gold and silver. And there's also other things, some gold, basins of gold um, of a thousand drams and two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold. Um, 
and said unto them, Ye are holy unto the Lord, the vessels are holy also, and the silver and the gold are a freewill offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. Watch ye and keep them, until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests and the Levites, and the chief of the fathers of Israel at Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So they're going to bring this gold and silver and all these offerings. They're going to bring them to Jerusalem and they're going to weigh them there. Right. So took the priests and the Levites, the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem unto the house of our God. So they're going to actually weigh them here. And then when they get to Jerusalem, they will weigh them again. And it says, then we departed from the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and of us and of such as lay in wait by the way. Okay, so we need to note that there's this gold and silver and there's three days, right? It's going to talk about these three days and they're going to leave on the 12th day of the first month. Um, now, William Miller, when he counted the 70 weeks, he said that they were fulfilled 490 years later to the day. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that statement of William Miller's. Um, was he correct? Yes, uh, and I wasn't aware of that statement. That's an inter interesting one. Okay, so it's, he's not correct because he made an error. So he believed that the going forth of the commandment is on the 12th day of the first month, which is not okay, correct. Okay, I stand corrected. Okay. And he had Jesus crucified on the 12th day of the first month um, in, th in um, 34 AD, marking the end of the 70 weeks. So one is he didn't have Jesus crucified in the midst of the week. He had Jesus, Jesus crucified at the end of the 70 weeks, the end of the 70th week. And he's going to have it 490 years from this date, the 12th day of the first month. And he's going to go to the 12th day of the first month in 34 AD. So we know Jesus wasn't crucified in 34 AD. He was crucified in 31 AD. We know that he was crucified in the midst of the week. And he definitely wasn't crucified 490 years after uh, the going forth of the commandment. Now, now this point it's here. Sort of, what led him? What led him to make those? Uh, what what led him to make those wrong conclusions? Well, That's interesting. Those, those go quite far off. Yeah. So, so I'm actually Angela's correcting me. So it's actually 33 A.D. He's going to have, but not 34. So we have the stoning of Stephen in the fall of 34, but he's going to have uh, Jesus crucified in the spring of 33 A.D., not 34. So the slip of the tongue there. Uh, thanks, Angela, for correcting me. So he's going to, because we can go from the spring of 457 to the spring of, of 33 that Miller had, and that would actually only be 490 years. Um, but the point is that I was focusing upon is this 12th day of the first month. Now, we can say that the going forth of the commandment is when Ezra leaves Babylon because he has the commandment there. Right. But technically, the river Ahava is the border where they're going to cross from Babylon into Syria. Right. So so technically, we could actually say the going forth of the commandment is on the 12th day of the first month. But another mistake that we make is we believe that when the going forth of the commandment occurs, but that's when the 70 weeks and the 2300 days begin. That would be an error as well. Um, so let's just quickly look at the prophecy, prophecy of Daniel, what it says. So in Daniel chapter 9, it says in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. Right. So. We think that the 70 weeks begins with the going forth of the commandment. Is that what it says? Yes. 
So it doesn't say that. We, we misread it. Now I'm going to uh, read it from the Bishop's Bible. So the Bishop's Bible has some fancy old English spelling, uh, but it, so it says, know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to bring again the people and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in straightness of times. Now, when it says to restore, so in the King James, it says the going forth of the commandment up uh, to restore. Uh, what does the word restore mean? To bring back. Yeah, so it, it means to turn back, right? Or to turn again. It's the word shuv in Hebrew. Um, now, in English... We can use the word restore in the same way, same way as, uh, so when we restore something, what do we do with it? We, we return it to its original uh, uh, condition, right? Yes. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, and there's even something even more special than just its original condition as well. It becomes more you unique and significant somehow in the yeah. restoration yeah but but the point that i'm making about the word restore is the old english word restore that was not used in the way that we use it today that is they didn't think of the word of restore as to fixing something up into its original condition they think of it as the word return so they could have easily translated as return the going forth of the commandment to return, and that's the return of the people, and to build Jerusalem. Can we see that there are three steps here? The going forth of the commandment, the return of the people, and the building of Jerusalem. Can we see that? Yeah, that's pretty neat. Yeah, it's not just one thing. It's not the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. It's the going forth of the commandment the return of the people and the building of Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. It's giving us three steps. So you saying restore is the people. It, it means return. It's the return of the people. It's not talking about restoring okay. and building Jerusalem. It's the return. It's the return of the people and the building of Jerusalem. There are three different things: the going forth of the commandment, the return of the people. So the going forth of the commandments in the spring, right? And we could technically say, you know, it's, it's the 12th day of the first month, but we could also say it's the first day of the first month, right? But it's in that period. And then the return of the people. Well, that's going to happen on the first day of the fifth month, right? That's when they return. And then the build is going to be in the fall. And we're going to look at what that yeah, yeah. is referring to. Because Jerusalem the thing about that word restore that, that this clears up for, for me is when I think of restore, I think of uh, restoring their their status or position, but it's the return physically is what they're speaking of more than the yeah, that's their, what the word uh, status. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's they're it's, not it's, restoring the truth; they're returning physically. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, that's very yeah, interesting. They're returning. It, this is a really common Hebrew word. Uh, shuvi, 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 hashulamit, return, return, o shulamite, return, right? It, it's all through the scriptures. We see this word shuv all the time. It's it's used in the sense of, you know, when they're the, the captivity and they they return, right? So that's this this word is just really common, but it refers to people returning or turning back, right? So they're going to return back to Jerusalem. And they're going to build Jerusalem. So there's the going forth of the commandment. It's not the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. As just like, there's just one thing. There's three things that are being referred to. And so, so we have to take all of these into account. That is, we're taking into account the events in 457 BC that are going to give us the starting point for um the 70 weeks and the 2300 days. And 
and, but first here, of course, the 70 weeks, right? So when they get back, um, let me see here. Um, I think I skipped that. Uh, where is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so they came to Jerusalem. So here we had, they left after three days. They leave on the, the 12th day of the first month. And we're going to show this all drawn out um, after three days. And then they come to Jerusalem. And we know they come to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. And then they're going to stay there for three days. And it says, now on the fourth day, was the silver and the gold and the vessels weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the priest, right? So, so there's going to be, uh, they get to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. And then they wait there for three days before they bring the gold and silver to the temple. Can we see that? So they get there on the first day of the fifth month, and then three days later, on the fourth day of the fifth month, they're going to bring the gold and silver to the temple. Okay? Um, now, so we're going to uh, look at this on a line, and I'm going to try to do it as a slideshow. So... So. The concordance I got there, though, it don't show Ezra. But this is this is talking about Daniel 9. I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong spot. I apologize. Okay, so. Okay. There we go. Okay, so you can see that now. <clears throat> so uh, this is 457 BC. And you can see that, uh, well, technically 457 BC is gonna, uh, it's, this is gonna run into 456 because around Tibet there, the 10th month, it's gonna begin 458 BC. But these are the events in 457 BC that we're gonna mark out here. Now, we know that he leaves Babylon on the first day of the first month. And then he's going to uh, go to the river Ahava, and they're going to spend three days there and then leave on the 12th day of the first month. Can people see this okay? I mean, it depends on the device you're looking at and what kind of internet you have. Okay. And then they get to Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. And then three days later on the fourth day of the fifth month, they're going to deliver that gold and silver. And from the first day of the, from the 12th day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month is 107 days. Okay, so that's if we count just a normal cardinal count. So we're going to count the 107 days. Okay. That makes sense to people. Now, 107 can symbolize the 10th day of the seventh month. So we need to keep that in mind. And it's also from Ezra 7 to 10 that we're studying. So that's the seventh month, 10th day. And the center of this, um, we're going to count as two periods of 54 days. So the first one's an inclusive count. And the next one's a or, uh, cardinal count. So we've got ordinal and cardinal. Um, and the center of this is the sixth day of the third month. So what's the sixth day of the third month? on the biblical calendar. Pentecost. So it's Pentecost, right? So we have Pentecost is the center of this chiasm. Now, if you count Pentecost, it's the 50th day, right? All right. The 50th day from when? Which, which date do you count Pentecost from? It's the 50th date. 50th day from what day? First well, on your screen is the 12th day of the first month. 
No, no. The, I'm saying it's the 50th day from what oh, day? Okay. I'll 14th day. It's not the 14th. Oh, the 16th then. The right, the wave time. offering. So the day Jesus cru is crucified is the 14th, and three days later he's going to be resurrected on the 16th day, the Sunday, and it's the wave offering. So they, they have the wave offering, and it's going to be 50 days to Pentecost, right? So that means if you count the 16th as the 50th day backwards, then the 15th will be the 51st day, and the 14th will be the 52nd day, and the 13th will be the 53rd, and the 12th day would be the 54th okay. day, right? So that's why it's 54 days counted that way, because we're using the Pentecost count. But then when we count from Pentecost to the first day of the fifth month, I'm just doing a, a regular cardinal count. And that's why 54 plus 54 adds up to 107 instead of 108 days, okay? So it's just... Learning how to count is one of the hardest things in uh, biblical chronology. Repeat that again. What's that? Repeat it again. Okay. So, so we have Pentecost. We count Pentecost as the 50th day. And so if I'm going to count the Pentecost count, I'm going to count 54 days back to the 12th day of the first month. But when I count from Pentecost... I'm not going to do an ordinal or an inclusive count. I'm just going to do a regular cardinal count. So that's going to be 54 days to the first day of the fifth month. And so if I add 54 ordinal days to 54 cardinal days, it will be 107 days cardinal, right? So that's why it's 107 days. So if I just start on the 12th day of the first month and I count, you know, the next day is the one, the next day after that is two. To get to the first day of the fifth month is 107 days. Then the nice thing about this study, I mean, I, I'm, make, I'm being quite detailed here, but you can show this to people. They don't need to know much about, you know, converting the biblical calendar or anything. Uh, you can just show this to them. You don't have to explain as much detail um, just to say that the one is ordinal, the other one isn't. Maybe that might help. But we have symbols here. The fifth day of the fourth month is symbolized by the number 54. And the 10th day of the seventh month is symbolized by the number 107. So keep that in mind in this study when we deal with Samuel Snow's letters. Now, we also notice these three days. So one is we have the gold and silver, or silver and gold, and the three days. And then we have the three days and then the silver and gold. And that's a mirror, correct? Yeah. Okay, so we got the silver and gold is weighed out. Three days go by, then they leave the river Hava, then they travel for 54 days, and, and that's going to be Pentecost, and then they travel for another 54 days, and they're going to arrive at Jerusalem, and then they're going to wait three days, and then they're going to bring the gold and silver. So it's done in a chiastic structure. And, and so this is just something that's I'm evident. Sorry, Theodore, can I ask a question? Yeah, of course you can. You, okay. <laughs> Well, you got you got fifty four days, right? And you was talking about Pentecost happens on the fiftieth day, right? Fiftieth day from the sixteenth day of the first month. Sixteenth day of the first month. That's why it's fifty four days because we're counting from the twelfth day, not the sixteenth. Okay. So um, add four days to add four days to fifty, and you get fifty four. Okay, I know how to do that. Could do that all. <laughs> But, <laughs> all right. Yeah. You go ahead. All right. Yeah. So we're just saying Pentecost is the 50th day. So if you go from the 16th to the Pentecost, it's the 50th day. If we go the back 16, to the, day, the 16th day of the first month. Right. Yeah. From the 16th day of the first month. But we're counting from the 12th day of the first month. Right. And so that's 54 days, not 50. Okay. 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 It's fine. It may be told so. Why did you then place these three days from the first of the first month up to the twelfth day of the first month? What what's the symbol of those three days? Okay, so the three days is a symbol. It, it's all through scripture. You got the three days in the story of Joseph with when he interprets the dreams of the butler and baker. You know, it, it's you know three days that Christ is in the tomb, right? So it's symbolizing 
uh, those three days, obviously the three days of Jonah, the three days in the book of Esther that she fasts, right? Night and day. And then on the third day, she goes between, before Xerxes, right? So you have this symbol of three days. So we have the chiasm in the story of Joseph. There's also a chiasm, right? And there's also a three days there. And there's lots of other similarities between uh, the story of Joseph and 457 BC. So, um, and, and we're going to look at some of those things as we go through these studies on symbolic use of numbers. But here we have this, this chiasm. So this chiasm is very clear. Now we know that Pentecost is important in relationship to the 70 weeks, isn't it? Because it's going to be a Pentecost that the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out you know, uh, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. Okay, so. Why do you have 154 days cardinal count, the other 54 days ordinal? Okay, because we count Pentecost ordinally. Why? That's just what the Bible does. Oh. It, it says Pentecost is the 50th day. That's what Pentecost means. So, so if I'm going to count the days, I'm going to use the Pentecost count because it's marking Pentecost. But from Pentecost, I'm just going to count a cardinal count. So together, there are two periods of 54 days. The first is ordinal. The second is cardinal. Okay? And th that's because of Pentecost. So that's why I did it. Okay? And, and then we get, of course, to... Uh, the first day of the fifth month, we have the three days. Now, we're also going to have another period of three days. So I'm going to have to leave this and go back to the scriptures. Oh. Yeah. When I get ready to divide it, when I get to get ready to copy it down, you move it. But that's all right. I get it later. <laughs> yeah, get it later. Okay. Now, what's going to happen in chapter nine? is Ezra's going to uh, observe, right? Now, his job, according to Artaxerxes' decree, is that he has to, and this is an important point, so I'm going to go back here. Um, we, we always think it's about building the temple, but it's not, right? Because it doesn't say anything, actually, about building the temple, only about giving some offerings to the house of God, which has already been built, right? Um so he's going to make this decree about all these things that he's going to bring uh, to the temple. But the main part of the decree is, um, and thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, and all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or imprisonment. We can see that there are four different uh, uh, punishments that Ezra is allowed to do under this decree. And in order to do that, he has to have magistrates and judges that are going to judge the people according to the laws of God, right? This is the main part of this decree. This is, this is, this is the whole uh, purpose of this decree is that prior to this decree, they don't have this authority. Right. That is, they have they built the temple, you know, 59 years earlier. But they don't have any administration in the city of Jerusalem. OK, does that make sense to people? That would be the, this would be the... So this is going to be the this is going to be the building of Jerusalem that's being referred to, not the building, the structural building of Jerusalem. But actually the setting up of the city of Jerusalem as a city. Okay. Now the civil part, the civil part is what you're civil part, yes. Yeah. So 
So Ezra is then is going to be looking at all of these things. He's going to see that there's these marriages to these strange wives in chapter nine, and, and he's upset about it. So in chapter 10, uh, it says, now when Ezra had prayed, when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him all out, out of Israel, a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept very sore, right? And, um, and then Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, we have trespassed against our God and have taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Right. So they're going to have this divorce proceedings and it's going to be done according to the law. He says, arise for the matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. And uh, then arose Ezra and made the chief priests, the Levites and all Israel to swear that they should do according to this word. Uh, that's going to be the word uh, debar, which is commandment some in, in Daniel chapter nine. And they swear. So we could say that according to this word, we could say it's that that word, but it's also the word or the decree also of Artaxerxes, right? The going forth of the commandment, this word, according to this word, he could, he could say it according to the power that's given in this decree of Artaxerxes, we can do this, okay? And Ezra rose up from before the house of God. And, and it's also interesting that um, when they're going to say here, they swear, um, that's the one to seven yourself, right? By an oath, seven times. So it's kind of interesting. We have the seven times right there. And Ezra rose up before the house of God and went to the chamber of Johanan, the son of Elisha. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water. For he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away. And they made a proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of the captivity that they should gather themselves unto Jerusalem. And whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited. So that's confiscation of goods and himself separated from the congregation. That's banishment of those that have been carried away. So two of uh, the punishments that he was authorized to now implement are going to be uh, put in this decree or this, you know, this calling uh, people to Jerusalem. Does that make sense? So that means, that means he set up the magistrates and the judges. In order to do this, he has had to set up this. And so that period of time in which he's going to set that up is from the time he arrives to Jerusalem and here then he enacts it, right? Okay, And it says, when the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together within three days, it was the ninth month on the 20th day of the month. And all the people sat in the street of the house of God and trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. So it's, it's raining. It's the rainy time of the year. And um, that's why, you know, it's. That's why it's raining, because it's the 20th day of the ninth month. That ninth month is the month uh, Kislev, right? So it's going to be... Um, now, this means that this this here is in the eighth year of Artaxerxes, right? Because it's in the, it's in the ninth month. From the first day of the seventh month to the 20th day of the ninth month, that's, that's all in the eighth year of Artaxerxes. It doesn't explicitly tell you that, but we know it by inference, okay? And then they're going to have, um, they're going to set up, so all the people come, they confess, they're going to get rid of these strange wives. And then it says, um, uh, let's see it here. Uh, must be earlier, I just missed it. 
Yes, it's verse 16. And the children of the captivity did so. And Ezra the priest with certain chiefs of chief of the fathers after the house of their fathers and all them by their names were separated and sat down in the first day of the 10th month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. So one thing we're going to see here is we're going to see there's a 10th day or the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. There's going to be this divorce proceedings. Right. And, and so it's get, we're going to that means the book of of the story of Ezra leaving from Babylon, going to Jerusalem is going to begin on the first day of the first month. And then it's going to end on the first day of the first month. It's one year. Right. We're going to we're going to address that later on in more detail. But this this is really important that we go through this slowly. Now, so I'm going to draw this on the line. So you can see we got the 20th day of the ninth month, and there's the three days before that. Now, this was back in 2015, I believe, I'm trying to think. No, it's 2016. In December of 2016, we were doing a study at my house with some people from Warburg Church. Um, uh, we'd been doing this study on, on uh, Friday nights, and we moved it uh, for a specific reason over to my friend's place. Uh, for a month or so. Um, and so we were at his place out in the country. And um, um, he's the one who noticed this. So we were drawing out this line and we were trying to understand, well, how do we get the 10th day of the seventh month in 457 BC? Why, why would we start there? We know it's in the fall, but you know we have, and, and we hadn't done the Pentecost chiasm yet. So we were just looking at the, the three days between the first day of the fifth month and the three days before uh, the 20th day of the ninth month. So those two periods of three days. So we hadn't noticed the first chiasm. We just were looking at this one. And so he asked the question, what's in the center, right? So it's a period of 138 days. Now, if we just did them as 30 day months, it'd be 140 days, okay? Uh, but he asked what was in the center. So you could count 140 days and divide it into two periods of 70 days if you wanted. Um, but technically, it's, you know, some of those months only have uh, 29 days and some have 30. Um, so it's, it's uh, 69 days. Uh, and the center of that is the 10th day of the seventh month. So, so when he noticed this, I mean, this is forever... Uh, imprinted in his mind, I'm sure, because he found this. He asked the question. We noticed it. Uh, so the 10th day of the seventh month is the center of this chiasm. That is, this is the building of Jerusalem, right? This is the going forth of the commandments on the 12th day of the first month, the return of the peoples on the first day of the fifth month, and the to build, the building of Jerusalem, is marked by this period of time where the center is the 10th day of the seventh month. And so we can argue that the 2300 days and the 70 weeks must be counted from the center of this chiasm because that chiasm is there. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Nicely done, yes. Okay, so. Um, and uh, just another point. Uh, yeah. The center between the first day of the first month and the 20th day of the ninth month is the 10th day of the fifth month. Uh, you're saying if we go from the, the which one? The... From the first day of the first month to the 20th oh, right. day of the ninth month. Yes, that's another chiasm. So we've looked at that before, right? So that is one of the things that we have in our history is the 10th day of the fifth month. And the 10th day of the fifth month is the destruction of the sanctuary, right? In, in 586 BC and in 70 AD. It's in both, both times the sanctuary is destroyed. It's destroyed on the 10th day of the fifth month. And if you count from the first day of the first month to the 20th day of the ninth month, the 10th day of the fifth month is counted. And remember in Daniel, it's going to not just talk about Christ being crucified in the midst of the week, which is a chiasm, 
but it's also going to talk about the destruction of the city and the sanctuary, right? So we can see that th th there's this, this becomes, uh, there's so many things that we can notice in scripture that continue to support the idea of the symbolic use of numbers. Now, um, I don't want to go too long here. So, so we're going to, we're going to just try to wrap this up. So what we see is we see we have these chiasms in 457 BC. So before I got to Samuel Snow's letters, back in, which is going to be in 2017, in 2016, this is what we discovered. And I actually um, presented this to Jeff because uh, we had some really nice weather in February of 2017. Um, and... Um, we ended up driving to uh, Eatonville, Heidi and I did, and, and we left on the 16th of February. Um, and uh, we got there on the 17th. So it's quite a drive, I drove all night. Um, and, and Jeff was there in Eatonville for a study. He was doing a, a study there at the, the church in the wilderness. And, and so we were there and I, and I shared this on the Sabbath, I think, or maybe even Friday night when there was a break, I shared this uh, chiasm of the 10th day of the seventh month. I hadn't actually figured out the Pentecost one yet. That was going to be later. Uh, so I only had the one with the 10th day of the seventh month to show him, um, which he was interested in. But that's going to lead later to understanding Samuel Snow's letters and all these various chiasms. But you can see how the week of Christ, the chiasm of the week of Christ, is is the main chiasm that we have that that is is the the basis of all of these others all of these are typical of christ's week right whether it's the two 12 60s whether it's the chiasms in the story of joseph um the chiasms in ezra any chiasm that we find the ones in samuel snow's letters millerite history these are all typical of Christ's structure. That is, they all relate to it. Uh, Christ's confirmation of these structures is the fact that he's crucified in the midst of the week. So, you know, just uh, to finish this off a little bit, you know, there's going to be... Uh, that, that, I just want to say uh, that is so rich. Like, we as Adventists are used to this, and it doesn't hardly even raise our eyebrows anymore. But to, for someone... That doesn't know this evidence for Jesus. It's astounding to them. We, we get kind of normalized. Yeah. Now I just I've, wanted to explain. That's really neat. Yeah. And, and I've shared this with lots of people, Adventists and non-Adventists. Um, I would say that non-Adventists are more receptive than Adventists. But the Adventists who are receptive, I mean, I remember showing it to one couple went to their house for Sabbath dinner. And of course he had heard a lot of rumors about me and everything. Um, and, and he says, this is what you're studying. He says, why do, why are people fighting against this? Like this just confirms Adventism, yeah. right? So we have the Pentecost, mm -hmm. which is dealing with the spring types, which is, is of course the 70 weeks. And then we have the 2300 days there with the day of atonement, which is the fall types. So this also shows that the 70 weeks and the 2300 days are together in this story of Ezra. That it's not just about the start of the 70 weeks, it's also about, about the start of the 2300 days. Okay, so, so we'll leave it at that. I know it's, it's a lot of information, but we're gonna, we're gonna continue to go through these ideas because this to me is one of the most, um, one is it's one of the simplest studies to show people. It doesn't, doesn't take much to show them in the story of Ezra, that these structures exist. And if you're sharing with Seventh-day Adventists and they're at all open, they should see the significance of it, right? So you're going to have Christ beginning his work in uh, inauguration of the sanctuary in heaven on Pentecost, Ellen White says, that when he inaugurates his work in heaven, like he anoints the sanctuary, the anointing of God's people on the day of Pentecost occurs. And then we know that um, the day of atonement, obviously the center of the next chiasm is, 
is going to be when Christ finishes his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So these two centers of these chiasms are fundamental to understanding Adventism. Okay. And I, final wanted, I wanted to comment. I wanted to comment about the the almost inability for Adventists to receive it uh, information like this is because the devil has done a good job. If you can say anything good about the devil, he's a hard worker, and he's worked hard to bring a lot of fallacies and timelines and prophecies uh, offshoots that distract us from what God wants us to focus on. Adventists are kind of, what would you call, uh, weary of these things sometimes. So that's one of the things to overcome. Oh, I've seen another one, they say. But sooner or later, right. the truth comes along, and that's what people aren't ready for yet. It has to be uh, the people who are searching for, for light. Now, and just to, answer, yeah, just to answer a question in, in the comments there, we count from the 16th day of the first month, 50 days, to get to Pentecost. So that's why Pentecost is always the sixth day of the third month. It was just, uh, just to clarify it there for Ron. Um, right? Does that make more sense, Ron? So you counting from the first day of the first month to the 16th day of the first month, and you're going from the 16th day of the first month to the sixth day of the third month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously the 16th day of the first month is is 16 days from the first day of the first month. Okay. The okay, day. I was going to ask you. About it's, that's the day Jesus was resurrected. That's the wave sheaf offering. That's why you count 50 days to Pentecost. So Jesus was 40 days with the disciples, and then they're going to be 10 days in the upper room, and then the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out on the day of Pentecost. So that's 50 days from when Jesus was resurrected. And so, so if you go back to the 12th day of the first month, that's 54 days. So okay. Clear. On, on the um, end of that line, you got a three there. Do, do you have a date for the um, three days on that? Would, would that be the, like the eighth, the first day of the, the eighth day of the fifth month? Okay, so I have a three that they're yeah, you, you said this is a this is a mirror, right? Yeah. So the All first right, you got three at the front and three at the back. So it would be eight days in the fifth month, right? The, oh, no, wait a minute. Yeah. No, it, no, it, it they be, get the river Ahava on the I'm sorry, probably, it's, probably the eighth day of the first month. And then they go to the temple in Jerusalem. It says it's on the fourth day of the fifth month. It doesn't actually say fifth month. It just says on the fourth day. So that's three days later, right? So they wait three days in Jerusalem. And it's going to be on a Sunday that they actually bring the golden temple, the gold and silver to the temple, right? So they, so they didn't bring it on the Sabbath. And they didn't bring it on the Friday, right? Um, they're, going to, they're going to bring it on the Sunday into the temple. But I'm going to go right, through so, more detail yes. next. All right, I just I, I made a mistake. I was count I'm, my ad ain't at right no more for some reason. I, but it's the third day of the fifth month would be the would be the um day right the third it's day the, of the fourth, fifth month. fourth day fourth day of the fifth month fourth the day of the fifth month fourth okay. day. So okay. they're there waiting three days, and then on the fourth day, they bring the gold and silver to the temple. Okay. I'm, okay. I, I, I apologize. Yeah, yeah just, just read the scripture there. If you read the scripture, it'll tell you that. Okay. Well, let's uh, close with prayer. Theodore. Yeah. Uh, I think I noticed a typo on your between the 54 days. It says six days for third month. I thought it was 16th day. No, it's the sixth day of the third month. Oh, I'm sorry. Because we're counting from the 16th day of the first month, 50 days. Not okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah, I tried to clarify that. Okay, let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, uh, we are so thankful for the studies that we've had today and for the Sabbath. And we're thankful for the crucifixion of Christ in the midst of the week. And we ask him 
always to be in our heart, to be in the midst of us, that he can be crucified again in us, that we can um, experience uh, the death to self, and that we can also experience the resurrection to new life. Uh, we pray um, that these truths that we have studied, even though they are mathematical, uh, that we can see the significance of them, that, that Palmoni reveals deep things in his word that can encourage us. And so we just pray, Lord, that uh, we can continue to study these things on our own and um, that we can come to know you better. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.